Okay, kia ora everybody and uh, welcome to our digital event today. Um, we're really glad to have you along with us and just giving it a few moments to let all of our attendees in um, since we've just hit live. Uh, I'm just going to start this off by running through a few housekeeping slides um, for those who uh, maybe haven't attended one of our events before before and for anybody that just needs a refresher of how they work. So um, for this event, just want to uh, give a special welcome and thank you to the U3A Wakatapu attendees um, who are all zooming in from down there. And thanks to John and Marion for all their work and putting this together with us. So kia ora everybody and welcome. Uh, we like to start off our Zoom events by sharing a little whakatoki and this one here sits above the desk of our Head of Researchers office uh, in our main offices in Auckland here and it goes, Ihara, takutoa, ete toa, takitahi, ingare, he toa, takitini and that translates to my strength is not as an individual but as a collective which we think is very fitting for the research space. Uh, as you can see, your camera and your microphone have been automatically turned off, so you won't be able to turn these on throughout the event, so that means that we can't see or hear you. But instead, we invite you to use the chat and Q&A functions during the session to communicate with us if you need to. You'll find them both at the bottom of your screen and they're labelled. To use the chat, you can just click on that icon and it will open up a pop-up box where you can type a message to uh, myself. So you can use this chat box to ask any technical um, questions and I'll do my best to help support you. Um, if you have any questions or for the end of the event when we open this up for the Q&A, um, you can use the Q&A box to submit any questions. So you just click on the Q&A icon and that will open up another pop-up box where you can type your question. So all of your questions will be visible by all of the other attendees. However, if you choose, you can select to send the question anonymously. Once it is submitted, I will either answer the question live with our presenter or we might type a response to you. Because we have a limited time frame today, uh, we might not be able to get to all of the questions, but we will do our best um, to answer them all. And please remember to keep all the questions related to the topic presented. So our speaker won't be able to answer any personal medical related questions that you might have. At the end of the session, the, the Zoom will end for everyone. It can be a little bit abrupt, so I apologize in advance for that. But the recording will be available on our website and our YouTube channel uh, later this week. So you can share it to anybody who missed it or watch it again if you'd like to. Uh, so just before I hand over, I thought we can just do a little bit more information about our speaker today. So today we are joined by Dr. Owen Jones who received his PhD from the University of Otago. He's now a research fellow in the Department of Psychology at the University of Otago. He has over a decade of experience researching the memory processes, and he has been published in numerous scientific journals. So we're very lucky to have him today. So with that, I will hand over to you, Owen, and thanks again, everyone, for joining. Thank you very much, Juliet. Right, I'll just share my screen. Just bear with me one second while I make sure that everything is as it should be. Right, okay, um, what don't know everyone? Uh, hopefully you can all see this the uh, the screen that I've put up and you can all uh, hear me. Uh, great to be here this morning. Thank you very much to Juliet and to the Neurological Foundation for the invitation to give this talk. Uh, also, thank you very much to John and Marion uh, for your work in organizing this on behalf of the University of the Third Age. So there'll be three parts to the presentation today. 
I thought I'd start off just by giving you a, a bit of a waltz through my uh, research history, where I started in brain research and uh, what I've been doing basically over the last 10 years of my career. I then thought for the second stage of the talk, I could uh, introduce you to some of our more recent findings and a new direction that my research stream has taken. Some exciting uh, preliminary results there. And then at the end of the talk, just to end on a, a positive note, I thought I would uh, give you a brief overview of what we can do to boost our brain's health and perhaps stave off some of the, uh, uh, the more deleterious effects of aging, particularly the possibility of dementia in later life. So let me just start my presentation and I'll get my pointer. There we go, to, to be a more appropriate option. So here we go. Okay, so I thought I'd just start off with a little brief bit about me. Uh, Juliet's actually done a pretty good job of covering this already. Uh, but anyway, I'm originally from Wales. I moved to New Zealand, to Dunedin specifically in 2007. And it was there that I met this man down here. This is Professor Cliff Abram, who is a longstanding member of the Department of Psychology here at Otago University. Some of you may have heard of Cliff, or maybe uh, you may have heard his um, public talks. He's done a lot of work for the University of the Third Age and for the Neurological Foundation over the years. So I was lucky enough to find myself in Cliff's lab uh, where I did my PhD, graduating in 2013. And you could uh, argue that, that was a lucky break for me or perhaps an unlucky break for Cliff. But anyway, I must have done something right because he allowed me to stay on in his lab as a postdoctoral fellow after completing my PhD. And since then, I've gone on to become a research fellow in the Department of Psychology. I also have a current teaching appointment. I teach two papers at uh, 300 level. Um, and uh, essentially, the story is that I have been there ever since. So it's a good place to be, obviously. So if you're familiar at all with Cliff or the work that has come out of his lab, then you will have heard of one word in particular, synapses. So Cliff's work is synonymous with synapses. Synapses, then, are the junctions between your neurons, your nerve cells. Uh, this is the site at which one cell makes contact with another cell in the brain. And if you want to know about synapses, and really you have to go back in time, uh, almost 150 years now, to see where the story starts. And it starts with the pioneering work of the Spanish neuroanatomist Santiago Ramón y Cajal. So Cajal was a, a very famous neuroanatomist. He won the Nobel Prize. Uh, and he made very good use of a particular staining method, which allowed him to get very, very detailed uh, microscopic uh, view of individual cells within the nervous system. He could look down his microscope, having stained little slices of tissue from the brain, for example, and he could make out individual cells. So a cell such as this one, which had a, a cell body with processes going from there on, and even these finer details extending away from each of these processes. Now, Cajal noticed something very interesting. He noticed that it seemed to, to him, at least, that there was uh, a very stereotype flow of information from one cell to the next. He noted that certain cells were extending projections that seemed to be making contact with the next cell in line. And then that cell in turn would send on a projection and that this seemed to be contacting the next cell and that this cell would send its own projection that made contact with the next one and so on and so forth. So Cajal posited that each one of these projections coming from one cell passing onto the next uh, would make a very small point of contact, which would allow one cell to communicate and transfer information to the next cell. And that's what we now call the synapse. So Cajal couldn't see this at the time because his microscope wasn't powerful enough. But if he did have a powerful enough microscope, he would have seen something perhaps looking a little bit like this cartoon here. He would have seen the end of one cell coming very close to the beginning of the next cell along. And this would be what we would now call a synapse, where the first cell would release a chemical, 
on to the next. And this is how information is transferred between your brain cells. Uh, this, is, this is how brain cells communicate with one another at these synapses. Now, each cell has thousands of these synapses, receiving many, many inputs from different cells. And what's critical to understanding how they are involved in information transfer and information storage uh, is to understand that these synapses are what we would call highly plastic structures. Synaptic plasticity is a very commonly used phrase in neuroscience. So what do we mean when we say that these structures are plastic? Well, what we really mean is that these synapses can actually change their structure and even their function. So if you were to look at where one cell makes contact with another cell in the brain, if you were to zoom in very, very closely on that synapse, you would find uh, that they actually come in many shapes and sizes and different flavors. You could have a very, very strong synapse, such as this one. It would be physically quite large. It would be releasing a lot of this neurotransmitter chemical, uh, which would then bind to and activate the next cell along. And if you were to measure the electrical signals generated at this synapse, you would find a relatively strong electrical signal that this cell was eliciting in the next cell along. But as I said, these structures are highly plastic. They can be very strong. They can also be very weak. So if you take a look at this example, this is a smaller synapse. It's physically smaller than the, the previous one. There's less chemical, less neurotransmitter being released, and it's binding to fewer receptor sites on the next cell along. And so if you did have a very small electrode that you could attach to this cell, you would see that the electrical signal generated at this synapse is relatively smaller, relatively weaker. And it's these electrical signals that we like to measure every day in the lab, uh, because these signals are the best way to tell us how strong a synapse actually is. Uh, it's a really, really good way of gauging the functional um, aspects of the synapse. So I mentioned that these synapses are plastic. And uh, the, the key discovery in the field of synaptic plasticity came in the 1970s by two very famous neuroscientists now, Tim Bliss and Terry Lomo. And this is work that they did in, in Norway in the early 70s. So what they found was that if you stimulate these synapses, they were using electrical stimulation. They had a small electrode inserted into the brain and they would zap these synapses with little bursts of high frequency stimulation just to mimic what might happen when an animal was receiving a lot of uh, information from its surroundings and might be forming a memory, for example. And what they found was if you zap these synapses repeatedly, briefly but repeatedly with little, uh, little jolts of electrical current, that actually the strength of the synapse increased. And not just did that synapse become stronger or those synapses become stronger, but they remained stronger for a long time, minutes or even hours. And they called this long-term potentiation or LTP. So this is a lasting increase in synapse strength. And people got very, very excited uh, by this phenomenon because they thought finally we understand now how the brain can store information, how the brain can store memories. You have circuits of brain cells that are highly active when we are forming a new memory. And then that memory is stored in those networks of active cells because they increase their connectivity with one another. They increase the strength of their synaptic connections with each other. And perhaps the best example uh, of just why this is a good memory mechanism comes from uh, Cliff Abram, my, my mentor here at Otago. So these down here, these are experiments that uh, he conducted in the early 2000s. Uh, in a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is known to be heavily involved in the formation and retrieval of certain memories. And he found, along with his colleagues, that if you were to stimulate, strongly stimulate these synapses, uh, and you look at the electrical waveforms that are generated, that these waveforms suddenly get much bigger. You can see that the amplitude of this waveform is larger than it was before stimulation and that these waveforms remain bigger and stronger, actually not just for minutes or hours, but for days. In this case, they could last for up to 100 days, and they still remained potentiated 
uh, from their previous level. And in fact, in one animal, they managed to track this uh, potentiation for as long as a year. So this is a very good candidate mechanism for long-term storage uh, of memories in the brain. So when I heard about this, I thought this was the most amazing thing ever. And so, of course, I wanted to, to stick around in Cliff's lab and I wanted to do a PhD on this topic. I thought it was fantastic. I thought it explained so much about how the brain works to me. And at the time, Cliff had a very interesting project that was ongoing in the lab. So they had found that, yes, synapses do become stronger when they are given these bursts of activity. But there's another side to this story. What they found was that if you were to stimulate cells at one point in time, that actually that could alter their ability for those synapses to strengthen later on. So for example, if we look at this schematic here, this cartoon here, if we were to electrically stimulate these synapses down here, they would become stronger. However, uh, some experiments in Cliff's lab had shown that if you were to first stimulate, let's say these synapses on the other side of the cell, deliver electrical stimulation to these synapses, what then would happen is that when we went to try to strengthen these synapses on this side of the cell, they weren't so receptive to that stimulation. They could no longer strengthen to the same degree. So we call this priming stimulation. We call this the effect of priming stimulation on later synaptic plasticity. So prior stimulation delivered to one side of the cell was inhibiting plasticity on the other side of the cell. And you can see this as evidenced on this figure here. So we have two groups here. We're measuring again the, the strength of those electrical signals uh, that I showed you in the previous figure. And in our control condition, we just give a burst of high frequency stimulation, HFS, and those synapses become stronger. Their, uh, their electrical signals become much bigger. However, in certain uh, conditions, we gave that prior priming stimulation, denoted up here. And then when we went to induce synaptic strengthening in these uh, slices of tissue, we found that the amount that we got was somewhat diminished. So we thought this was very exciting. This was highly novel, uh, not something that uh, other groups had shown, uh, but we were talking about quite a, a spatially and temporally widespread regulation of synaptic plasticity. So we undernared about what could be doing this. We wondered if maybe the cells were somehow running out of energy or running out of some kind of resource or being overstimulated to some degree. And that then was what was responsible for these cells not being so plastic later on. Uh, however, uh, no matter what we tried in the lab, we could not find any mechanism uh, in these neurons, in these nerve cells that might accomplish uh, this effect. Now, at the time, there was a lot of talk about the communication between neurons, your nerve cells, the electrically active cells of the brain, and other cells in the brain called astrocytes. So astrocytes, so-called because they're shaped like stars. So they're star-shaped cells. And they're a type of glial cell. Now, glial cells are typically considered to be the support cells of your nervous system. An astrocyte, for example, will sit here next to the blood supply. And the one end will be taking nutrients from the blood supply, all of those uh, sugars and other nutrients that the brain needs. And then these other processes will be making contact with the neurons and their synapses and feeding the neurons, essentially giving the neurons what they need to be able to, to function healthily to the, to the best of their capabilities. But it turns out that these astrocytes are doing a lot more than just being passive support elements of the nervous system. It turns out that these uh, astrocytes can actually be active players at the synapse. They release a heck of a lot of different chemicals that can influence the communication between neurons. Uh, I won't go into the list of chemicals. There's no need to, to go into that level of detail. Uh, but suffice it to say that we now know, we now understand that these astrocytes are active players in many brain processes and including the regulation of the plasticity of these synapses that I've talked about already. So we came up with a model uh, where we thought that maybe when we delivered our priming stimulation to one side of the cell, we weren't just activating the neuron, we might be activating nearby astrocytes denoted here as these brown star shaped cells. And these astrocytes, they form a network of their own. They're very highly connected and what might be happening is that they would be signaling amongst themselves and then eventually releasing some kind of chemical 
onto these synapses quite a distance away, and that this might be interfering with the ability of these synapses to strengthen. So these glial cells, these astrocytes, were dampening down the plasticity of those synapses. So we had a hypothesis, and we decided to check this out. And indeed, we, this is exactly what we found. So we did a number of experiments where we would uh, manipulate the activity of these astrocytes. We could wash on drugs that would selectively block the activation of astrocytes. Uh, this is one experiment where we used a tiny, tiny little glass pipette that was attached just to a single astrocyte, one single cell, uh, which has been stained here with a dye to make it appear white. And we could deliver a drug selectively to this one cell to block its activity. And what we found is that when we did this, uh, we actually blocked our priming effect. So if you look at this uh, graph down here, again, we're, we're looking at the size of these synaptic electrical impulses that we can generate. And sure enough, in our control condition, we could generate robust strengthening of these synapses. These electrical signals became bigger. In the condition where we'd given our prior priming stimulation, as expected, these synapses could not strengthen to the same degree. But in blue here, these blue dots, this is the condition where we'd block the activity of just that one astrocyte in the vicinity of these synapses. And that restored plasticity. Uh, to control levels. So it blocked the effects of that prior priming stimulation. So this showed to us conclusively that astrocytes, these glial cells, were dampening down what these synapses were capable of doing. But that leads to two possible, uh, two, two important questions. The first is how is this happening? What is it that these astrocytes are releasing that could be inhibiting plasticity? And then second, what is the, the functional consequence of this effect? Now, it was around this time that our lab was joined by uh, this man here. This is Anurag Singh, who was a PhD student in Cliff's lab working on this project. He's now uh, a research fellow in the pharmacology department down here at Otago. Now, Anurag was very interested in this project, and he made two key discoveries uh, during the course of his PhD. So the first, uh, was that he discovered uh, that there was a certain molecule, an inflammatory molecule called TNF or tumor necrosis factor. We'll just call it TNF, that's a simpler name. Now this is an inflammatory molecule that Anurag was interested in because it's very heavily implicated in the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. So inflammation is a key component of Alzheimer's disease and TNF is one of the main molecules that drives inflammation in the Alzheimer's brain. And we were thinking, well, if these synapses can't strengthen so much, then perhaps that might be related to the loss of memory processes, for example, in, in Alzheimer's or other conditions. And so Anurag was interested in, in one of these key molecules that might be blocking memory formation in Alzheimer's disease as TNF. And so his first key discovery was to use a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. This is a model uh, that expresses certain uh, genes that will trigger humans to develop Alzheimer's disease. So it's a model of the, the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. You, you insert this gene into the mouse, and sure enough, the mouse will develop pathological deficits that are reminiscent of what you would see in a human being with Alzheimer's disease. Now, Anurag showed that if you were to look at the brain tissue of these mice, early on, there's not much difference between wild type mice, WT wild type mice, and these transgenic, these genetically modified Alzheimer's type mice in terms of the amount of TNF in their brains, tumor necrosis factor, there's not much difference. But as the animals age, getting to around nine months old, which is uh, towards the end of, of midlife going into early later life in a human, should we say? Uh, then all of a sudden, these Alzheimer's type mice, you see a massive upregulation in their brains of the, in the amount of TNF that's being produced. So we thought that was quite interesting. This inflammatory molecule is being upregulated massively in the brains of these aged mice that display Alzheimer's type pathology. Now, Anurag then started to wonder if maybe our priming effect, this inhibition of plasticity, might also be uh, dependent on this, this molecule, TNF. And he found something 
very, very interesting. In these Alzheimer's mice, these mice uh, that display Alzheimer's type pathology, synapse strengthening was already weaker than it would normally be. In the older mice, particularly, the synapses could not get stronger. It was very, very difficult for them to do that. Uh, so you can see here, for example, uh, if, if you were to look at these black dots here, this is uh, the amount of uh, synapse strengthening that we were able to induce in our um, Alzheimer's type mice. Not very much at all. And the interesting thing is that if, even if we gave our priming stimulation a prior stimulation like we did in our earlier experiments to these mice, that that did not alter the amount of plasticity that we could see later on. And it's because plasticity was already weaker to begin with. So it looked like that priming mechanism was already engaged in the Alzheimer's type brains of these mice. But what's important here is that if you put on a drug that blocks TNF signaling, if you put on an antibody that would just bind to and mop up that nasty pro-inflammatory molecule I talked about, all of a sudden, the amount of plasticity that you can induce goes up. So what this tells you is that synapse strengthening is already diminished in these Alzheimer's type mouse brains. And it's probably due to the presence of this inflammatory molecule, TNF. If you block TNF, if you neutralize TNF, then you restore the ability to induce synapse strengthening. So that's the story so far with that particular uh, straight stream of research that's been going on in the lab. Uh, and the conclusions that we can draw from this are that we know that synapses between neurons are actually regulated by other cells, the local astrocytes. And we know that these astrocytes release this inflammatory molecule, TNF, that this could then block synapse strengthening. And that we know that the high levels of TNF in the brains of Alzheimer's model mice uh, will also induce this blockade of synapse strengthening. So this leads us to the current research questions which are ongoing in the lab. How does this mechanism then contribute to learning and memory deficits, perhaps not just in Alzheimer's models, but also in other models that also uh, are characterized by high levels of inflammation? And that's work that's ongoing in the lab. We have a wonderful postdoc in the lab, Shruti Satish, and we have a new PhD student that's about to start on this project. And so they're looking into the behavioral and cognitive uh, follow on of, of the engagement of these mechanisms. But my involvement with this project, it's still ongoing. Uh, I'm still supervising a PhD that's involved with this project. Uh, but in recent years, my interests uh, have diverted to another condition, another kind of dementia. And uh, so I'd like to change lanes a little bit now and talk about my more recent work uh, into fronted temporal dementia mechanisms. And this is work that's been recently funded by the Neurological Foundation. So frontal temporal dementia, so we don't really hear so much about this, so it's probably good just to give you a bit of an overview of this condition. We hear a lot about Alzheimer's disease, so we know what that is, but frontal temporal dementia is a little bit different. So dementia, uh, just generally, dementia, uh, dementias are conditions which affect multiple modes of cognition to a, a, a meaningful degree, a way that will impact your day-to-day -day living. So, for example, uh, forgetting where you've placed your car keys in the morning, that's perfectly normal. I do that all the time. That's just what happens, particularly in the aging brain. You can expect that those kinds of minor lapses in, in memory and minor episodes of forgetfulness will occur. That's perfectly normal. Uh, on the other hand, if you are driving your car and you suddenly realize that you've forgotten where you are and where you're going, that's something more serious, that's something more meaningful that will impact your day-to-day -day life. And so that might be the kind of thing that would uh, signal that uh, uh, there was an episode of cognitive decline that might therefore develop into, into dementia. Now, with frontotemporal dementia, you do get memory deficits, but they tend to be quite late in the piece. They are secondary to other deficits that are seen. Uh, and typically we see deficits going in one or two, one of two different directions. And it all depends on which portion of the brain has been uh, affected first and foremost. So as the name might suggest, frontotemporal dementia, 
there are two key parts of the brain that we're talking about here. We're talking about the frontal lobe and then the temporal lobe on the side of the brain above the temples. Now, if the frontal lobe is uh, hit first in this condition, this can lead to uh, quite significant changes in personality. So for example, people might start displaying socially inappropriate behavior. They might be less able to regulate their own behavior. They would display poor self-control and perhaps poor forward planning, poor judgment, and so on. On the other hand, if the temporal lobe, if the side of the brain is more profoundly affected, then this typically manifests with difficulties with speech and language, whether the production of words or an inability to understand the meaning of words. Uh, and frontotemporal dementia, although it's, it's not quite as common as Alzheimer's disease, it is in fact the most common type of dementia that you would see in people under the age of 65 years old. Now, why do we care so much about frontotemporal dementia? Why do we need to do research on frontotemporal dementia? Uh, well, sadly, it's because there is currently no cure. Uh, in fact, we don't even have a, a viable treatment that could slow down the progression of frontotemporal dementia. And this is a big problem because the disease is ultimately fatal. Typically, from the point of symptom onset, an individual would have a life expectancy somewhere in the range of 7 to 13 years. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, brain atrophy is inevitable. And uh, that would then, in the end, lead to death. So if you take a look at these brain scans that we have on the right here, we have brain scans taken of an individual who had been diagnosed with frontotemporal dementia, or FTD for short. These left panes, these are scans taken of this individual's brain at the age of 47. These right-hand panes, these are follow-up scans that were taken at the age of 51. Now. What we want to look at here is the amount of gray in this man's brain. So the gray here, this is the brain tissue. The black that you can see in between, uh, these are gaps essentially uh, formed uh, in the folds between brain tissue. Now comparing this scan here at 47 years old with this scan here at 51 years old, you can see that there's a thinning of these gray zones, so less brain tissue. And instead, of course, we see these larger gaps, just empty space, essentially, in black here. And it's particularly noticeable here in this frontal portion of the brain. Not just the frontal portion of the brain, but you can see that the atrophy is very prominent here in the front. So this individual had uh, severe atrophy of the frontal lobes. So this corresponds to that behavioral variant that I talked about before. Uh, he didn't have language deficits, but he did have profound changes in personality and judgment and reasoning. So this is a disaster. Uh, in fact, this, this individual uh, was actually, um, dead not long after the second scan was taken. So uh, he, uh, he died at the age of 55, unfortunately. So it's a very fast acting form of de dementia, very aggressive. And we really desperately need to find some way of doing something about this. So where would we start looking? Well, one reasonable uh, suggestion might be to start looking at the genetics of frontotemporal dementia. Now, we know that about 40%, at least 40% of cases of frontotemporal dementia run in families. This doesn't necessarily mean that they're genetic. You might have various members of the same family, even across generations, that have been exposed to the same environmental risk factors. If you had an entire family that, for example, was born into poverty, had low educational attainment, uh, perhaps had certain uh, other environmental challenges, including poor diet, lack of exercise, things like this. These would all be risk factors that might pre predispose a whole family towards uh, getting dementia later on in life. Now, however, we do know that with frontotemporal dementia, there is also a strong genetic component. In fact, there are over 80 different genetic mutations that have been associated with frontotemporal dementia. So it makes sense from a research point of view to look at both of these things, of course, to look at lifestyle uh, and the impact of various lifestyle changes, uh, but also to look at the genes involved. And there's one prominent gene that has been implicated time and again uh, in the, the, the pathology of, of frontotemporal dementia. And this is called the MAPT gene, uh, M-A-P-T gene. And this is a gene that I'm very interested in with good reason. 
Now, MAPT, M-A-P-T, this is the microtubule associated protein tau gene. We're just going to call that protein just simply tau protein. It's a much easier term and it's what everyone in the field calls it. So this is tau protein. Now, some of you may have heard of tau before. Tau, tau is a protein that's implicated in many gene, in many uh, diseases, not just in frontotemporal dementia, also in Alzheimer's disease, also in other neurological conditions. And the MAP gene is the gene that encodes and is responsible for producing this protein, tau protein. So what is tau protein? Well, tau protein is a protein that's absolutely essential uh, to the integrity of your cells. If you can imagine this, there's actually a skeleton of a sort, a type of scaffold that runs through the length of your brain cells. So in this process here, if you were to look inside, you would actually, actually see quite a rigid structure, a tube-like structure like this. And this would be the cell's skeleton, the cytoskeleton as it's called. And it's a, a, basically a bunch of proteins that have been tightly compacted together and wound into these tubes. And this is what gives you the cells scaffolding, its structural support that allows the rest of the cell to, to grow healthily around it. And tau protein normally in the healthy brain would just sit on these microtubules as they're called, the cell skeleton. It just sits there and it's very, very important for holding these uh, tubes together. Now, if tau leaves the cytoskeleton, then what happens is that these tubes of protein start to disintegrate. They literally start to fall to pieces. And in fact, we know that that's a process that happens in many disease states for, for various reasons. And there are two things here. There are two big issues. The first is that when you lose the, the structural integrity of the cell skeleton, then of course the cell as a whole has become compromised. The, uh, the processes that it extends will quite literally start to atrophy, start to shrink. Uh, and also that tau protein, now that it's left the cell skeleton, what does it start to do? Tau protein sounds, starts to form aggregates. It starts to clump together and form these tangles, these tangled clumps of, of tau protein that uh, eventually will have toxic effects on the cell. And what these tangles are hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, also very commonly seen in frontotemporal dementia, also seen in a lot of other neurological conditions uh, that uh, aside from dementia. So for example, temporal lobe epilepsy is associated with the formation of these tangles. Traumatic brain injury is associated with the formation of these tangles. So understanding tau protein, understanding how tau protein leaves the cell skeleton and how it forms these tangles, that's very important for a host of neurological conditions. There's a lot of research going into tau. It's, uh, it seemed to be, uh, tau, tau's uh, activity is seen to be altered in many conditions. Now I'm interested in tau for a, a separate reason. So I mentioned before that I'm very interested in synapses and I'm very interested in the plasticity of synapses, the ability of these synapses to change and how this relates to the uh, formation and storage of, of information, of memories. Now we know that tau protein aside from being involved in the structural integrity of the cell, it's also very involved in synapse strength. In fact, we know that uh, in, a, in a host of conditions, as well as in the healthy brain, tau protein is implicated in the weakening of these synapses. So tau protein is involved in, in processes that stop one cell from communicating as strongly with another cell. And what's particularly important about this is that we're talking about changes that are seen long before you see any kind of disruption to the structural integrity of the cell and long before we start to see cells dying in pathologies such as Alzheimer's or frontotemporal dementia. This is a very early stage change. Uh, so for example, if you look at this uh, little cartoon here, what would happen is that as this synapse here is weakening, we would see little bits of tau dissociate from the cell skeleton. And this would somehow be involved in taking these uh, receptor proteins from the membrane, from the cell's wall, inside the cell, so they're fewer in number. And so that means that the, the other cell can com communicate less with this cell. It means that this synapse is weaker. And so this might be somehow related to the memory deficits and the learning deficits that we see in, in many forms of dementia. And as I said, you see it very, very early on before cells start to die. Uh, you'll see a progression of events. You'll first of all see that these synapses cannot become stronger. Uh, 
then you'll see they start to actively weaken. Then you'll see that they'll be lost forever permanently. And then the cell itself will start to, to shrivel and eventually atrophy and die. So this leads us to a very interesting research question then. What's going on then at these synapses early in the stages of a condition like frontotemporal dementia or Alzheimer's disease? How does tau contribute to the weakening of synapses? Is it that tau itself is responsible for weakening the synapse? Or is it that when these synapses weaken naturally, that that then gives you some kind of overproduction of tau protein, something like that? So there's a bit of a chicken or egg question here. Either way, it's very important to understand how tau protein is involved uh, with the weakening of synapses. Now, a few years ago, we were very fortunate to get our hands on a, a mouse model of frontotemporal dementia. The so-called PS19 mice, you'll hear me talk about them a lot. PS19, this is just the name of the mutation, really. Uh, and it's, it's a mutation that is seen in certain families. There are now families all around the world that have, have been found to, to have this mutation, and all of them all of these families uh, that display this mutation go on to develop frontotemporal dementia. It's not the only genetic mutation that can trigger frontotemporal dementia, but it is one of the most studied ones, and it is one that's been seen in multiple families in various places around the world. And this triggers a very early onset form of frontotemporal dementia, very aggressive form. Uh, now, what's typically seen in humans and indeed in these model mice that mimic this condition is that we first see deficits in the strengthening of synapses. So this is uh, what's being shown in this, uh, in, in this uh, diagram here. So we have two groups of mice. The white uh, icons here are your non-transgenic, non-modified controls. And then in black here, we have uh, the results from our PS19 mice that have harbor this uh, mutation. You can think of them as these frontotemporal dementia model mice. And again, what we're looking at here is those electrical impulses that are generated at synapses. And if we stimulate them at time point zero here, they get stronger. Uh, however, the, the ones in black, the, the ones that have this mutated tau protein, they start to quickly weaken. You can see that by an hour later that they're significantly weaker than their non-mutated counterparts. So what this shows is that the tau mutation that we're talking about uh, is uh, implicated in, in the, the diminished ability to strengthen those synapses. And this is what you would see probably around the age of six months or so in these mice. So that corresponds to, to late middle age in a human being. And what you then find is that uh, as the animal ages to say nine months or perhaps 12 months, then you start to see the atrophy, the loss of brain tissue. First of all, it starts in the hippocampus, which is very heavily involved in learning and memory. And then at 12 months, by the time they hit 12 months, the outer layers of the brain, the cerebral cortex have also started to lose their volume. So these are quite late uh, changes. Uh, quite late in the story. But as I said, I'm very interested in what's happening earlier in life, because if you think about it, it might well be that what's happening earlier in life that is driving all of these subsequent changes. So if you can understand what happens first and foremost, the, the earliest brain changes, that then gives us the better understanding of how it develops into these full-blown dementia symptoms later on, perhaps. So we need to understand the early pathology. So I started using these PS19 mice and I started using them at a younger age, at two to three months old, which really uh, corresponds to being a, a juvenile human or a, a young adult human. And I found actually that at this age, synapse strengthening seems to be completely intact in these mice. So I've got two groups of, of mice here, my regular wild type mice and my PS19 mice that have this mutated tau protein that you see in front of temporal dementia uh, patients. And sure enough, when we applied uh, our bursts of stimulation to, the, to this tissue, those electrical signals that we generate, they got bigger and they stayed bigger for the course of the experiment. And it was to a similar degree in both groups of mice. In fact, if anything, these PS19 mice initially at least had slightly greater uh, strengthening of their synapses, not to any meaningful degree. By the end of the experiment, they're on a par with their wild type counterparts. But this is very different to what people see later on in life. So I thought for a second, well, that's, that's 
potentially a bit disappointing. I was hoping to see some kind of change early on that might hint at what was happening later. Uh, but then just completely through uh, serendipity, we came across a very uh, unexpected finding. Now, we were very interested in the role of certain channels, calcium channels, uh, in mediating the strengthening or weakening of, of synapses. And so I decided to repeat this experiment with one particular drug, nemodipine. Now, nemodipine is a drug that blocks calcium channels. Calcium channel blockers are very, very commonly used, uh, for example, to treat uh, heart conditions. Many people around the world will take calcium channel blockers. And so I was interested uh, in calcium channels in general, and I decided to repeat these experiments, but in the presence of a drug, drug that blocks these calcium channels. And very unexpectedly, what I found was that in the PS19 mice, and only in the PS19 mice, that plasticity, the strengthening of synapses, was completely blocked when you block these calcium channels. Now, this is very strange. This is not what we would normally see. If you look at these wild type mice, they still show very strong potentiation, very strong strengthening of their synapses, even though they've been exposed to this drug. But these PS19 mice, these frontotemporal dementia model mice, plasticity in these mice, synapse strengthening in these mice, seems to be completely dependent on calcium channels. If you block the calcium channels, you block that strengthening of synapses. And that was very unexpected. So we decided just to make sure we do a, a sort of a, a reverse experiment this time around, what we would do is instead of trying to block calcium channels, we'd wash on a drug that activates calcium channels. It makes them open and allows calcium to rush into the cell. And we actually found more or less the opposite effect. Now this drug here, it's a very catchy name, Bay K8644, don't worry about the name. This is just simply a drug that opens calcium channels. And what we found was that if we wash this drug on to tissue from these PS19 mice, that we got a massive strengthening of these synapses. A little bit of a strengthening of the wild type synapses also, but nothing in comparison to what we saw in these mice that display this mutated tau protein. So we're seeing very, very strong potentiation of synapses with drugs that open calcium channels and correspondingly, a very, very strong block of synapse strengthening with any drug that would block these calcium channels. So these two sets of results go very uh, nicely together. Now, so far, I've talked about the strength of synapses. I've talked about the plasticity of these synapses and how that's important for information storage. But I wouldn't want you to think that synapses are the only sites of plasticity. Yes, of course, these synapses, these connections between neurons, between nerve cells can become stronger, it can become weaker. Uh, but it's by far and away not the only mechanism that might be involved in learning and memory. So if you like to um, think of it this way, you can consider synapses to be the sites of input onto a neuron. This orange cell here, this orange neuron, this is receiving multiple inputs from this purple one, okay, via these synapses. So each one of these are little, little electrical signals that you see here generated at each synapse that this cell has, this is a little bit of electrical input onto this cell. And if it were to receive enough input, then it would generate its own output, its own electrical signal that would travel down its processes that would then activate these synapses onto the next cell in turn. And it turns out that this output signal of the neuron, this can also be upregulated or downregulated. So when synapses are strengthened, this would strengthen the input onto the cell, but there's also a separate form of plasticity to consider here. You, we, we could talk about the excitability, how responsive this other cell is. So uh, in response to synaptic input, it might be generating a single electrical impulse of its own, or it could be generating many electrical impulses. So this could be considered uh, a, a change in that neuron's excitability. When a neuron's excitability is increased, this increases its output onto the next cell in turn. So I thought, well, that's another way that we could look at plasticity in these PS19 mice. What's happening to its excitability? What's happening to its propensity to generate these electrical impulses? And so sure enough, I went back to my recordings with this drug that opens calcium channels, this Bay K construct that I talked about here. And we saw something very, very striking. 
only in the PS19 mice, only in these mice that are models of frontotemporal dementia. If you wash this drug on that opens calcium channels, then all of a sudden, the number of electrical impulses being generated by these cells increases massively. It has a very, very long lasting and very pronounced effect, not just on the amount of synaptic input that these cells are receiving, but also in the amount of electrical output that they're generating in response. So we have two forms of plasticity here. We have the plasticity of synapses and the plasticity of excitability or neuronal output. And this was something that we haven't actually seen uh, in, in any other studies uh, or even heard of for that matter. So that's just a little bit of a taster of what we've managed to do in the lab in recent times. Uh, but this is an ongoing project. I have funding from the Neurological Foundation to continue this. And we have some very important uh, questions that I'll get to in a bit that we need to address. But the conclusions that we have so far are that calcium channels, for some reason, have become overactive in this mouse model of frontotemporal dementia. And they're now major triggers of multiple types of plasticity. And that these changes are found even in very young mouse brains, long before other changes are seen, long before neurons start to die. Now, also, because these mice have a mutation to the gene that produces tau protein, we now have a link between tau protein and calcium channels. And as it turns out, a few other people have seen something similar. Uh, a very small number of studies, uh, but they all report exactly the same thing. They all show that tau protein is in some way associated with boosting calcium channel signals. So we're very interested in chasing that up, and we have some important questions that we need to address here. First, how does tau protein alter the activation of calcium channels? And then second, how does this contribute to the later pathology that we would see perhaps in frontotemporal dementia? And then critically, the most important question perhaps, can this process be stopped? And of note here is the fact that many calcium channel blockers, as I already pointed out, are commonly used for other conditions. So we already have many drugs that are available for treating heart conditions, for example, that could in theory be used to stop any augmentation of calcium channel signaling in frontotemporal dementia if our results pan out and if we, we find, as we believe we will, uh, that these calcium channels are driving some of the later pathology. Uh, but that's all to come. Uh, there are uh, many things that we need to do before I can give you any definitive results on this. We have a, a two-year project, uh, two years of funding, uh, so that will be a talk for another time. And I'm happy to come back and talk to you later at some stage about that. But as, as it stands, these are open questions that we're currently researching in the lab. Now, I was given a very specific brief when I was asked to do this talk. I was asked to talk about my research, and I was very happy to do that. But of course, it's very easy to, to uh, form the opinion that there is nothing that you can do to, to ward off uh, brain aging and keep your brain healthy and prevent dementia. It's, it can be a very negative experience talking about this, uh, these kinds of things and listening to these kinds of things, particularly as we know because uh, the world's population is aging very rapidly. We know that a lot of the risk factors um, uh, for dementia, such as obesity, such as cardiovascular disease, are also increasing. And we also know that none of these conditions actually have a cure. So it's very easy to, to, to believe that, you know, it's all completely hopeless. There's nothing that we can do to stave off dementia. And it, we're basically all heading to this, this tragic uh, scenario late in life. But I was asked to, um, to perhaps not end on such a negative note. I was asked to, to talk about what we can actually do to prevent dementia. Uh, and actually, I just want to make it very clear that the answer is emphatically yes, we can do things in many cases to prevent dementia. In fact, there's very good evidence to suggest that there are a whole raft of changes to our lifestyle that we could make uh, that can significantly reduce the, uh, the rate uh, or the onset of dementia. So what are they? Well, these are things that you may have heard of already. There are some key ones. Exercise is a major, major uh, factor here. Physical activity in later life is, is associated with the, the, the health of synapses in general, synapse number, the integrity of those synapses. So certainly uh, exercise is good for your brain, uh, but more specifically, uh, 
we now have increasing evidence to show, show that physical activity will reduce the risk of dementia and by a stunning amount, perhaps even up to 50%. That's a stunning amount. Uh, so and it's been shown that even mild exercise, for example, just gardening uh, can have a beneficial effect. However, there does seem to be a dose dependent effect. If you've heard of people that talk about getting their 10,000 steps in a day, it does seem that incrementing the number of steps that you take up to that point of 10,000 is actually associated with increased protection from uh, dementia. And this is this is even in later life. If you if you make these uh, these lifestyle changes even in later life, they can have these protective effects. So certainly, exercise seems to be good for the brain in general, but particularly good for guarding against dementia. Uh, the second important point is diet. This is again something that you may have heard of, in particular the Mediterranean diet. So a diet that's uh, high in fruit and vegetables healthy fats such as olive oil, uh, less processed foods, moderate sugar intake, for example. There's, a, there's good evidence now that adherence to the Mediterranean diet is also associated not just with generally less cognitive decline, but also a lower risk of dementia. Uh, so definitely upping your fruit and vegetable intake, uh, staying away from too many saturated fats and swapping them out for unsaturated fats, such as those that you'd find in, in olive oil, for example. These are all good ideas. Uh, also, there's recent evidence that highly processed foods, for example, foods that include a lot of highly processed sugars, uh, these might increase the risk of dementia. So certainly a good diet is also something to aspire to. And the third biggest one is low social contact. So social isolation is associated with a whole raft of negative outcomes, and dementia happens to be one of them. Uh, what's great, though, is that if you happen to be uh, somebody who partakes of regular socialization, you can, uh, you can actually mitigate these effects quite uh, significantly. So uh, if you were someone who, for whatever reason, uh, was prone to being socially isolated, this can actually increase your risk of dementia by a, a huge amount, by 50%. It also poses an additional problem because you're less likely to get treatment. You're less likely to seek treatment. It's less likely to be picked up on uh, by those around you uh, that you might need to get treatment or get help at least. So social isolation, isolation is a big problem, uh, but you can mitigate these effects, of course, by making sure that you meet up with your friends uh, quite often, uh, socializing, staying in good contact and so on and so forth. Exercise, of course, might also uh, be a, a beneficial in this regard. If you happen to be partaking of group exercise, this is a great way to stay social and make sure that you're boosting your brain health through other ways too. Now, there are a whole raft of factors that have been implicated in the, in the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, smoking, drinking alcohol, air pollution is a recent one that's been um, noted. Uh, these, these are all things that you uh, really ought to be uh, cognizant of, to be aware of, and if it is appropriate for you to make certain lifestyle changes, and of course, reducing smoking, reducing alcohol consumption, these are things that will be uh, of benefit to you. But I just wanted to bring your attention to something that not many people are aware of, and that's that sensory impairment is also a major driver of uh, dementia risk. Now, what do we mean by sensory impairment? Well, basically, I am talking about impairment to functions such as vision, such as hearing, possibly even to your sense of balance. Now, there's very good evidence to suggest that loss of hearing and loss of vision are risk factors for dementia. Uh, now, this could be because you're less likely to partake in physical activity or perhaps decrease socializing uh, when you lose your sense of hearing or you lose your sense of vision. Also, we know that these things can trigger the upregulation of inflammation in the brain, including the upregulation of that TNF molecule that I talked about earlier. So what can we do about this? Well, there's very good news here. If you happen to use a hearing aid, this will then decrease your risk of dementia if you've lost some aspect of your hearing. Similarly, if you happen to be someone who's developed cataracts and you have visual impairment, you can reduce your risk of dementia significantly by having those cataracts removed through surgery. So the key point here is that restoring your sensory function and looking after your sensory function can reduce your dementia risk considerably. And we're talking about a massive amount here, 25 to 30% perhaps, so nothing trivial, very important.
So the overall picture here is that we have a growing list of modifiable lifestyle factors that contribute to dementia and that we could, if we were to address these lifestyle factors, reduce dementia incidence by 40% by the most recent estimates. Now that's massive. That's a huge amount. If we had a drug that did that, it would be considered a roaring success. But that's not to say that we don't need a drug. We still need a cure. We still need viable treatments. Uh, and we are working on that. There are many people around the world working on that. But there is a lot that we can do even without one at any age. And with that, I'd just like to give some quick acknowledgements. I'd like to acknowledge Cliff Abram and his help and support over the years, along with the members of his lab. I'd also like to acknowledge the generous funding that I've received from the New Zealand Health Research Council, and in particular, the Neurological Foundation of New Zealand, who have been with me every step of the way, right through from PhD to where I currently sit. And thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much, Owen. That was so um, fascinating. Uh, and I wanted to just say that our CEO, who I'm sure is watching from the office at the moment, was very happy to know about the 10,000 steps. Mm -hmm. uh, he is a very dedicated 10,000 steps achiever. Um, well done, Rich. Yes. <laughs> so... I would like to now open up the floor to some questions. So a reminder, you can use the Q&A box down the bottom. Um, I will just, oh, oh, and if you want to just stop sharing your screen and then it might be a little easier for us to see. Sure. We've got a few questions that have come through already. So um, we will start off with, if you take calcium channel blockers for heart disease. Um, can it make you more susceptible to, to dementia? Does that have an effect, I suppose? Um, sorry, I'm just trying to um, remember how does one stop screen sharing in Zoom? <laughs> so this, <laughs> this, is, this is the normal uh, um, onset of memory impairment. I'm just trying to find the, you know, no matter how many times you do this, there's always... Of course. Uh, there's always something that you're looking for that you can't quite find now. There should be a little... There we go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, stop sharing. Lovely. Perfect. Right. There we now, go. <laughs> sorry, if I can just have that question again, that would be great. Of course. Uh, the question is about calcium channel blockers for heart disease. Mm -hmm. So relating to what you talked about earlier in your, in your presentation, do, can that have an effect on your susceptibility? Do you know if there have been studies? There have not been any studies. So this is where we want our work to go in future. So right now we're just laying the groundwork. We are just looking at one particular mutation um, that seems to show a link between tau protein and calcium channels. Now, as I mentioned, there are a few other studies that have also looked at this link and some of them look at other frontotemporal dementia mutations and they've shown a similar thing. They have shown that always, uh, there are only five studies that, are, um, that have looked at this, but all five of them show the same story. These mutations that trigger some kind of uh, mutation to the tau protein that makes it stop binding to the microtubules, the cytoskeleton, they all lead to the activation of calcium channels later on. Now, what does this mean? We don't know for sure yet. We think that it means that calcium channels are going to be driving some of the, the processes that you see going wrong later in frontotemporal dementia. Uh, however, I would just like to, to make it very clear, there are many mutations that can trigger frontotemporal dementia. And there are some forms of frontotemporal dementia that as far as we know, don't have a genetic basis. So in terms of good solid evidence for the role of calcium channels and the possibility of using calcium channel blockers, uh, we don't have that yet. What we'd like to do, once we've got all the groundwork sorted with what we're doing in this project, uh, and we will also extend to other mutations in this project as well, we'll look at other mutations just to see how general our results, how generalizable our results are. What we'd like to do in future work is then, depending on what we find, then it would be reasonable to perhaps look at uh, clinically relevant data in human populations, look to see if there are already any trends out there for, um, for, the, for, for calcium channel blockers and their use in frontotemporal dementia, and then 
years down the line, perhaps even move to a clinical trial, but that's, that's all years away. So as yet, we don't have any solid evidence to suggest that calcium channel blockers can prevent or treat frontotemporal dementia. Uh, but certainly our results give us a little bit of hope that that's something that we could be looking at in future. Okay, yeah, thank you. And um, it kind of does tie in with that adage of the, the more you know, the more you want to know, the less you know. <laughs> Always more questions. Absolutely. Um, and this question has come in from U3A, so thanks team. Is there a natural shrinkage of the brain with age? Uh, to some degree, yes, there is, but nothing, nothing so prolific as what we would see in the brain of somebody with dementia. You, it, it really is use it or lose it. So, uh, you know, there, there are classic examples uh, of individuals who have enlarged uh, brain regions. So taxi drivers in London, they have to have very, very good knowledge of, of you know, the, the map of all of this, the roads, the streets in London. Um, and their hippocampus, which is often considered to be the brain's GPS system, if you like, that might not be the best way to describe it, but it is very involved in, in spatial navigation. Uh, the, the hippocampus in a taxi driver in London would be somewhat enlarged. And that would remain until, you know, middle age at least. Uh, so it's a use it or lose it thing. If, if you don't use a particular brain region, then yes, it will atrophy to some degree. And we know that as we age, uh, there is a, a certain amount of, of atrophy, but it's not, it's not really as anywhere near as significant as what you would see in the brain of somebody with dementia. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I think that your comment of use it or lose it answers this question about mm -hmm. cognitive activity preventing dementia. Um, I think I can safely say that, yes, playing chess and learning new languages, all of that helps, right? Uh, yeah, so uh, there's very good evidence to, su to suggest that the, um, well, two things. First of all, your, uh, the amount of time you spend in education as a younger person has a protective effect later in life. So definitely the young people in your lives, make sure that you try to get them to stay in education for as long as possible. Also, uh, once they leave education and enter the job market, people who have cognitively demanding jobs uh, they seem to also have some kind of protection, some level of protection against later dementia. The, the incidence of dementia in people who have cognitively demanding uh, roles tends to be lower. So this is thought to work by boosting your cognitive reserve. So later on, if some of these uh, cellular processes that I've talked about do kick in and you start to lose the occasional brain cell, it might just be that the other ones are able to compensate that much better. So, so certainly try to remain uh, as, as cognitively active as you can. Now, in, in terms of how you would do that later in life, we hear a lot about things like uh, brain training, you know, puzzle games and so on and so forth. There's, there's nothing wrong with those per se, uh, but there's no strong evidence to suggest that those just by themselves would be good enough to prevent dementia. So if you consider the, the role of education earlier in life, you're talking about a heck of a lot of learning, uh, lots of different modalities of learning, math, language, history, geography, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so just sticking to one kind of brain game probably isn't going to cut it. If you could partake in as many different cognitive activities later in life, that might be a better suggestion. So by all means, do those puzzles, You know, do, play Wordle, every day, that's fine, do Sudoku, uh, play chess as well, learn a language as well, read as book, many books as you can. And then also um, when you consider the role of exercise, exercise isn't just for the body, exercise is for the brain as well. If you think about something like playing table tennis, there's a lot of sensory information coming in. There's a lot of motor activity. There's a lot of coordination between what you see and the way that you have to move your hand and so on and so forth. That's going to engage a massive amount of brain tissue. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of your brain that's devoted to visual processing. There's a lot of your brain that's devoted to motor activity. So something like that, some kind of exercise like that, that's not just a workout for your body. That's in itself a cognitive exercise. So trying to pair up as many different cognitive uh, exercises you can with physical activity, that would probably be the best way forward. That's the recipe for 
success. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say we did have an interesting talk last week um, with a professor from AUT who discussed balance mm -hmm. that uh, changes as we age. So for all those watching at home, the recording of that event will be up uh, later this week as well. So there could be some good tips in there. Mm -hmm. um, standing on one foot while doing a Sudoku, I believe was mentioned during that event. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so this question is about the plasticity. So mm -hmm. does a single brain injury or trauma to the brain have implications for the synapses, plasticity or functioning? Uh, yes, that, that's a great question. So damage to the brain uh, in many cases uh, th through stroke or through traumatic injury uh, has been shown to downregulate the ability of synapses to strengthen. So there, there are many people who've shown this. So, for example, um, coming back to uh, my, my um, what I said about astrocytes. So in the brains of people who've had a stroke, for example, um, uh, those astrocytes start releasing certain chemicals around the area of the stroke that would dampen down synaptic activity and synapse strengthening. So that's one kind of... Um, that's one kind of effect. Traumatic brain injury is another one. So a former member of Cliff Abrams lab, who's now gone back to the, the US, Akiva Cohen. So he has shown that with um, a model of, of traumatic brain injury, that the, um, the, the synapses aren't able to get all the nutrients that they need from the blood supply. And this is again due to the astrocytes. The astrocytes are this intermediary. They, you know, they, they sit there between the blood supply and the neurons, shuttling things back and forth, clearing away any nasty toxins, Etc. Uh, any nasty molecules that are building up, uh, and what, what Kiva has shown is that you can replenish the diet of brain injured mice and rats with certain uh, essential nutrients that they would be be lacking because the astrocytes aren't able to to support the neurons as well, and that can ameliorate the effects of that traumatic injury on those synapses. So yes, there are there are a number of ways that any kind of damage can impact on synapses, but the the general gist of it is that you tend to see a, um, a change such that synapses uh, are less able to strengthen. The, the one caveat to this is epilepsy. Temporal lobe epilepsy in particular, if, you, if you've had a, a bang to the side of the head, which makes that portion of the temporal lobe seizurgenic, then cells can become somewhat more excitable. Uh, and the problem is there that some of the inhibitory uh, neurons, the neurons that would normally be calming things down, they're some of the ones that die off first. So you're losing that breaking mechanism. You're losing a break on how strong synapses can become. So in the role in the in the brain of somebody with temporal lobe epilepsy, you might expect to see some aberrant strengthening of synapses itself, which would then contribute to the generation of seizures potentially. Wow, okay. And so I guess that would also uh, include damage from a condition such as MS, which isn't necessarily an impact driven thing but would still have an impact on the plasticity uh yeah so good question so um i actually have colleagues uh, in the lab who are starting to look at, uh, at multiple sclerosis now so one thing we know about uh, multiple sclerosis is that inflammation is a massive uh, part of the the process of that disease so yes absolutely um that that's going to have an impact on plasticity as well uh, whether you're talking about um, the plasticity of, of excitability or synapses, th th these are all um, interesting questions. And I, I, I'm not really an MS researcher, so I wouldn't know too much about that. But yes, I do know that inflammation is a, a massive contributor to, to the pathology of MS. And that that, of course, is going to have an effect on plasticity later down the line. Mm, yes, absolutely. Uh, okay, and so back to uh, the, the TNF, which so mm. I can't remember what that stands for. <laughs> um, have antibodies against TNF been trialed in Alzheimer's in the disease? So not antibodies, but something similar. Okay. So there, there is a group in America, in the United States, that uh, have started using... Uh, drugs that essentially mop up excess TNF. They, um, the problem is getting them into the brain. So we have this blood brain barrier. So just injecting something into the bloodstream or just swallowing a pill doesn't necessarily mean that something is going to end up inside your head. Uh, there is a group that has been trialing a particular drug that mops up uh, TNF. Um, some 
conflicting ideas about what's going on there. This particular group seems to think it's it's a wonder drug. Um, they seem to, well, they believe that they found a specific way of getting this drug into the brain. And so they have these patients, there are video recordings of them, they're given this drug and they, they suddenly, you know, immediately uh, become more responsive, more cognitively capable. There are others who would question those results. Uh, sorry to put a, a downer on things, but there are others who question whether you can actually get the drug into the brain in the way that they're describing. Uh, really, what we need is a, a large scale clinical trial, really, really good population level data with thousands of participants so that we can get a really, really good fine grained picture of what's going on uh, and look at the size of any effects that we see across a whole population. That would be the best indicator. We don't have that yet. Mm. People are trying this out, but we're, I, I'm unaware of any, any really gold standard evidence to suggest that these drugs work. Sure, absolutely. Excuse me. Um, and it's about quarter past 11, so we might make this the last question. Uh, so does knowledge around frontotemporal dementia shed any light on age-related dementia? Oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> good one to finish it off. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, this actually comes back to some of my preliminary results. So uh, if you recall, I talked about um, calcium channels becoming triggers of plasticity in, in our mouse model of frontotemporal dementia and how that's not normally seen. Now, there's a caveat to this. That is seen in the normal healthy brain much, much, much later on. Um, so as uh, if you have a mouse uh, model that you're aging in the lab, you would not see an effect of those calcium channel blockers on plasticity early on in life for the first, let's say, year of a mouse's life. When the mouse gets quite old, then those processes become susceptible to calcium channel blockers. So it's very early days, and I, I don't want to say hand on heart, this is exactly what's happening, but it does beg the question, are we looking at some kind of form of accelerated aging? Are these neurons, for some reason, then getting, um, getting old before their time in, in frontotemporal dementia? Is that, is that why these calcium channels are becoming so much more important for the induction of plasticity? So that you know I, i'm extrapolating from my, my very basic results so the long story short is that we we couldn't be sure but it, it wouldn't surprise me if with further research we found that actually with with some aspects of dementia what we're looking at here is really an accelerated version of the normal aging um progression mm, fascinating and and there was a great one to end on mm. <laughs> um so i just want to say sorry to those whose questions we didn't get to uh, but please know that we appreciate you sending them through. Uh, Dr. Jones's talk, the recording will be available later on our, later this week on our website. And there has been a few instances that have referred back to other recordings for other events um, during your event, which is really cool. So please, everybody, check out our lecture library. There's actually an event up there with Professor Cliff Abraham, which is your mentor and mm -hmm. Steph Hughes and, and Shane Oline from last year that we did about memory. So uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. And thank you to U3A Wakatipu as well and everybody in the room down there. And we will talk to you again all soon. Thanks again, Owen. Thank you very much. Kakite. Kakite.